Excellence, which is the brand new name of African Ascent International, which have been called such for the last 15 years, brings you for the second time one of Berkeley College's music stars, who is an assistant professor of music therapy in the Department of Music Therapy and the Jazz Institute. Patricia Perez is also married to a Berkeley top, almost a legend, Danilo Perez. She is originally from Chile, and Danilo Perez is from Panamia. The combination of these duo uh, artists cannot help but produce the best of the best, which is the kind of data that is appropriate for excellence with Professor Theodor Skiros. Tonight, we're going to break down with Patricia Perez's help everything that you need to know about the Panama, its musical tradition, its cultural nuances, its great musicians, its turbulent and triumphant history. All of this to be presented to you legibly, clearly, and passionately by Patricia Perez from Berkeley College of Music. Excellence with Professor Theodros Kiros is supported by the Hutchins Center at Harvard University, and of course, my own college, my own university, Berkeley College of Music. Welcome to Excellence and Excellence's second episode since, it's adapt since it adapted its new name. So Patricia, uh, for the next one hour or so, I have uh, several questions that I would like you to examine um, as we analyze uh, the content of your extraordinary book, The Musical and Cultural Narratives of Jazz, colon, the Panamian Suite, which is a book that follows uh, your earlier book, which was received extremely well, Silence and Loud Music, The Transmusical Journey, of a jazz musician. Welcome to Excellence for the second time. So let's begin talking by the, uh, about the idea of sweets. Why sweets? Why did you give this incredible book the second name, sweets? What is a sweet? Thank you, Professor Tedros, and thanks for uh, having me here in your program. Um, in regards to the book Panamanian Suite. Um, the book is, is called Panamanian Suite because um, I wanted to borrow a musical device for the structure of this book. So in, in modern music, a, a suite is a, an extended musical composition. So it's performing a series of pieces or what we call movements. And these movements are linked by a common musical or conceptual theme. And uh, I wanted to use this the suite, this idea of the suite as a metaphor or a framing device for this complex narrative about the history of jazz in Panama and the history of jazz in general, but specifically in Panama and the relationship between uh, the history of jazz in Panama and the United States. And this happens in, in music. We use the suite to tell these complex stories that are, um, let's say, a, a framing device. And, and you could kind of tell uh, epic tales about something big and something, you know, journeys that take a long time um, and dense themes that are musical. And this happens uh, as well, you know, in music as well as in, in the history of music. So I wanted to use and create this Panamanian suite because it also, the suite as a musical form started developing in the 16th century. So I wanted to um, kind of make a comparison with the history of, of Panama the modern history of Panama, because of course, be before the 16th century and the 15th century, of course, there was another history that uh, is not well known. 
and it's the history of the indigenous peoples of the Americas. But when colonization happened in the Americas, a new history started. Let's say, you know, the, the history of modern times in the Americas. But um, in, in at the same time, the development of the musical form called Suite started happening. So I wanted to have a, um, let's say, a framing device, musical device, because at the end of the day, I think these books is for people that love music, but also for musicians, for musicians uh, that want to experiment with music, that want to know about music and the historical context of music, but also <clears throat> they want to know the music um, of the, of, you know, what I'm talking about. So you will see that I have a website called panamaniansuite.com. And there I put all the music that I'm talking about in the book. And the music is actually in audio form and translated to notation too. And you can actually hear every song that I talk about in the book. Um, and you have links to all of the musicians that I'm talking about. So the idea is to have not only to read the history, but also to hear the history. Okay. So I wanted this to be like a bigger suite. That's incredible. And now, um, uh, and take us through the musical journey of the book itself, with its tones, its rhythms, its data, its nuances, and so on. Why three movements? Why not five, for example? Did you choose the term three as a magical one? Or is there a reason behind you know, speaking about three movements of the suite? Well, in, in music, usually the, the suite has three movements. Mm -hmm. uh, the musical movement of the suite has three movements. And I wanted to... Um, that I thought that the book and the research in general kind of developed in three different parts. Mm -hmm. So it was um, it was kind of a natural thing to put it into three spaces. Also, um, and I can tell you a little more how this developed. So I was happily ever after writing this um, paper, I wanted to publish about Panamanians in jazz, which is actually the central part of the story. But then, you know, these pre-jazz era started to appear in my research. And this pre-jazz era, uh, I call it the era of creating the imaginary Panama. And this uh, era actually uh, started in the 1880s with the first music that the United States wrote uh, for Panama, Panamanian Walls in 1880, and then uh, ended when the Panama, after the Panama Canal um, opened its doors, uh, and there's a whole body of musical work that I wasn't really looking at, but that no matter how, you know, how many times I would go back to jazz in Panama, this music we, would haunt me. So it became the first movement. So before I even talk about jazz in Panama, I had to, like this music was too important not to talk about um, and to leave it out. So uh, I had to, uh, let's say, separate this history of jazz in uh, the history of pre-jazz, the history of jazz in Panama, and what today we call global jazz, which is a kind of a new, a new perspective on jazz and globalization. So these three movements kind of represent the three eras of jazz in Panama and its relationship to the United States. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm struck by the um, use of the word um, imaginary. Uh, which, um, as you, um, uh, as you, as you, um, uh, as you argue in the book, is indebted to the role of the imaginary in Orientalism by the great cultural critic and political theorist Edward Said, who left us uh, rather early. You have used this concept of the imaginary brilliantly. I thought uh, very enticing. 
both musically and culturally. And uh, I would like you to address the specificity of the Panamanian imaginary. Uh, not all imaginaries are the same. They are cultural and experience specific. I am sure, if I am right, that is the case, um, that the use of the imaginary must also be specific to the Panama. Let's talk about the Panamanian imaginary then. Yes, yeah, so, so this is what I talk about in the first movement of the book or the first part of the book, is um, which is titled Creating the Panamanian Imaginary. And I would, I, I present in my book that this Panamanian Imaginary was created um, as a romantic image, as, as two, uh, I would say as there were two imaginaries. Uh, that were contradicting themselves. One of them was the image of the people of African heritage from Panama, uh, the people that were Afro-Panamanians, that are Afro-Panamanians from Panama, but they are Afro-Panamanians coming from different migration periods. Um, and these Afro-Panamanian imaginaries are always uh, shown as, you know, this male um, Afro-Panamanian, lazy, uh, simpleton um, man who is always enjoying and laughing and with his hands in his pockets, never working, always kind of enjoying the natural beauty of Panama, happy all the time, very, very related to, um, Jim Crow. I later call this, you know, I, I make a comparison with Panama and call it Jim Crow with the Panama hat. Yeah. Because this is this is an imaginary Panamanian uh, that was uh, never working, never really working in the construction of the Panama Canal, which was actually why people went to Panama uh, in the 19th century. Uh, so so on the other side, we had another imaginary, the imaginary um, heroic white male worker from the United States, you know, toiling to be the Panama Canal, you know, and, and completely, uh, you know, a, a hero, uh, you know, how, uh, you know, they, they would triumph over the tropical environment. How would they pretty much construct the Panama Canal by themselves. Um, of course, the Afro-Panamanian imaginary as, as a lazy man, as somebody who is always entertaining and happy, never working, had the female imaginary that was uh, this, you know, African woman who was very close to the jungle, very close to a, a primitive being that was almost like an animalistic object. So, and and for the um, white male worker from the United States, the imaginary woman, I had to be, of course, a white woman from Panama or a woman of Spanish descent. Uh, it was pictured in the music as 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 you know the most Spanish as possible. You know, with with uh, bulls at some point, like almost as if we were in Spain. And this Panamanian uh, woman of you know European heritage, because we're we're here concerned um, about be about being as close as possible to Europe. This Panamanian woman, you know, is is a, a woman that is constantly waiting for the man that has no agency, that is always uh, saying yes to everything, uh, that is you know a total. Um, you know, object, let's say, with with no other function but but to wait for the um, white male U.S. worker of the Panama Canal. And uh, these were two imaginary stereotypes that were embedded in the music of the United States and Europe, you know, to the picked Panama to sell 
the the Panama Canal to sell it to the people, to the people of the United States and Europe, um, and also to the people uh, West West Indians who were in Caribbean peoples that came to work to the Panama Canal. The idea was to show that you weren't really gonna work. You were gonna have a lot of money and a Panama hat, and you know you were going to have fun. But you know, of course, the contrary was the the opposite was the reality. The reality was that people, especially Afro Panamanians from the Caribbean, went to Panama to work at the Panama Canal to build the Panama Canal. But let that me, wasn't. Let uh, me part of it. let me intervene here mm -hmm. before you go too far. Um, let's talk about the Jim Crow uh, in Panama hat. Uh, one of the manifestations of what you just called uh, smartly, the uh, panamina, the uh, others imagination, the American imagination of the Panamanian personality. Let's detail that. Let's spend some time on that. And then I'm going to ask you subsequent to that to contrast it with the imaginary of the Panamanians of themselves, particularly of their musical productions. So let's begin with the first. Let's detail the Jim Crow uh, in Panama hat. I am, I am struck by that. So, so the, the Jim Crow with the Panama hat is a concept that I um, took from a song written in 1902 by Jean Vaughn and Tom Lemonier with lyrics by Alex Rogers. And this song is called The Coon with the Panama, meaning the coon with the Panama hat. And I take I take this song and I make a concept out of this because this, uh, the image of this, uh, let's say coon with the Panama, it comes from the same imaginary as Jim Crow. Remember the the imaginary of Jim Crow, this happy slave who is actually, remember that Jim Crow was a white man who painted his face black and acted as if he was a black man, a slave. So, but this was a happy slave. So uh, I made the comparison with the Panama, the coon with the Panama, because this coon with the Panama hat is also happy. It's never working is always entertainment, entertaining. You know, he always has his hand in, in his pockets. And there's also another song called uh, The Panama Rag, which is also depicted in the front page as a, you know, the image of this song uh, at the beginning of the song is a, is a black man, again, with the same characteristics. So this man is always happy and entertaining strolling around town, he's never working. And, you know, this, this uh, idea of Jim Crow, uh, remember was a very important cultural icon in the United States for many decades. And this cultural icon and this way to showcase this imaginary was exported to Panama via music, but you know, in the music, but via the coon with the Panama. And uh, it's, this is a caricature, you know, of the black man, a caricature of a black man that again, that is not working. And it's a figure that serves to imagine, you know, this Panaman Afro-Panamanian or Caribbean person who's going to, um, you know, to, to Panama, camouflage. This is a, a is camouflage in catchy tunes and memorable lyrics. So this is an idea that really uh, is, you know, a mythology uh, because this, this song also shows that this, you know, mythological character also doesn't speak very well English. Uh, and, you know, the song goes like, um, we want to be, they say, we want to be more like white folks every day. 
insisting that what is the style for them is the style for us. So this is a, a black man that just want to be like a white man. And that's, that's a mythology. That's the mythology of white supremacy. And it, it gets exported through the music to Panama in part to create the same apartheid and to justify the same apartheid system that we uh, that people here in the southern part of the United States lived on a daily basis. You know, the Jim Crow laws. Uh, in Panama, they were called the gold and, system, uh, and silver system. Uh, and the gold and silver system pretty much play, paid in gold coins to the white workers of the United States that were building the Panama Canal and in local silver coin, which had uh, very little, um, uh, you know, it, they, it wasn't as, as um, you know, it, it didn't have as much power as gold. So um, what happened was that we create then a uh, mythology that the this um, Afro Panamanian person is there in Panama, goes there to have fun, uh, and does not go there to work almost as a slave. The same thing that happens in the United States with this mythological ca character of uh, Jim Crow, that you know is the, the happy slave, I would say, but in this case, um, is the happy coon with the Panama hat. And now, let's contrast that uh, directly, if you like, with the counter-imaginary of the local population, most, most particularly Panamanians of African descent. How did they view of themselves and how did they orchestrate their musical talents? What are some of the lyrics, memorable lyrics, that you could share with us that represent a Panamanian self-consciousness, self-awareness, self-description, self-understanding, if there is one. I'm sure there is. All imaginaries have counter-imaginaries at some level. Yes, absolutely. So uh, the reality in Panama is that uh, Panama has an incredible amount of different diverse peoples because remember that Panama was one of the first um where actually was the first first settlement of the Americas uh in 1513 so what happens is that and and it's also a, a very important port in the Caribbean so what happens is that uh, all of the migrations and the movement, the transnational movements from the Caribbean, from South America to Central America to North America, pretty much they go through Panama. And of course, you know, in the 15th, 16th, 17th century, 18th century and, and later, um, all of the imperial powers from Europe and then later the United States were looking at Panama because since uh you know, the 15th, the early 15th century, people knew the great empires, the big empires of Europe and, and the United States of the uh, 16th, 17th and 18th century. They knew that Panama was the thinnest space in the Americas and that whoever controlled that space would have the connection between the two oceans. This was well known since 1513, since the, the uh, you know, discovery of the, of the Pacific Ocean. So, so people, you know, Panama was incredibly, always has been incredibly diverse, um, holding a lot of music, lots of immigrants from many parts of the world, and a lot of people that go from north to south, from south to north, and from east to west. So we have a rich culture of, um, you know, pretty much people, the different peoples and the different cultures um, from the Caribbean, 
um, specifically from Jamaica, there was a lot of um, a movement between Jamaica and Panama, between Barbados and Panama, between Trinidad and Tobago and Panama. And of course, a lot of movement between the Americas, North and South America. You go, you have to go through Panama. And then later, you know, from the East Coast, remember that Panama was at the very beginning since the 1850s. And because they built the transatlantic railroad in the 1850s in Panama, the United States built it. Because of that, Panama was also the connection between the East Coast of the United States and the West Coast of the United States. So Panama has been always incredibly rich in music, rich in culture, also because we have in Panama lots of many different uh, indigenous communities, communities from the Cunas, the Emberas, the Nove Bugle, who are active, politically active, and they have socially active and of course culturally active. So we have an incredible amount of culture in Panama. And the Panama Canal, of course, did affect it. It did make a big impression uh, in Panama, but also uh, we have to know that because of the Panama Canal and before the railroad and before that, uh, everyone who passed through there, through Panama, uh, Panama is incredibly rich. And this is how uh, jazz evolves almost at the same time as in the United States, because we have to think that since the 1850s, the United States and Panama had, um, you know, incredible amounts of connection, cultural connections, because we remember we had at some point, you know, a uh, uh, ship going from New York and New Orleans every week to Panama. Mm -hmm. This is one of the ports that you would stop whenever you go to South America whenever you would go to the East Coast or West Coast of the United States. This is, you know, the, the bridge, I would say. Um, and and um, we cannot really say Panama is a one dimensional space because it has many, many dimensions, many, many cultures and uh, because of the many migration periods. All right. Now then, uh, at the expense of uh, belaboring the point, but this is so central, uh, that maybe then uh, we should talk in some detail about the real history of jazz in the Panama, uh, guided by this counter imaginary within the context of the dominant imaginary that was blocking it from becoming visible and the counter imaginary gives it visibility, which in turn gives rise to the real history of jazz in Panama. Yes, I uh, mentioned in the book that I think the real history of jazz, again, comes from, you know, starting in the 18th, it comes from pre-jazz, because we we got to remember that, you know, the, the, the army, the war uh, bands, were present uh, at all wars and uh, the the army the instruments the movement between the united states and and panama brought instruments and music back and forth from new Orleans and from new york on a uh, weekly basis so so because of this movement and and because panama is such an important port in the caribbean a lot of musicians developed in Panama and then moved to the United States. First developed in Panama because there was a lot of musical interchange within the uh, Caribbean, but also within the Caribbean and uh, New Orleans and New York, which were the two kind of central spaces for jazz, but also with South America. So as early, for example, as 1892, we have figures like Vernon Andrade, who was born in Kingston, Jamaica, but he moved to Panama. So he was related to Panama. His family was Panamanian. Um, and he, you know, worked in the banana boat, because remember at the end of the 
20th century in the you know at, at the beginning of the 19th century uh banana was a a big a, one of the biggest uh, exports from panama to the united states so because of the banana fruit company that was stationed in Bocas del Toro. We had people like him that was a multi-instrumentalist who originally came to the United States to study um, dentistry, which was common also for uh, British West Indian families, but in general in West Indian families that had, again, a connection with the United States who would speak English. Remember that uh, British West, West Indians would speak English and would have English names. Though that's one of the um, also reasons why we don't um, think and we don't question that they're Panamanians or that they lived in Panama or they have any connection to Panama and Latin America. So him, for example, as early as uh, 1892, this person, you know, uh, was born in uh, started playing music. Many, many of the musicians, uh, for the jazz musicians that I mentioned in the book, come from musical families. They are exposed to music since they're little. So when they're teenagers, or even sometimes even before that, they are already, let's say, in the scene. So, you know, this uh, person, Vernon Andrade, for example, uh, in the 1920s, he was already moving from Panama to New York in a banana boat. And uh, he played, you know, with Fletch and Henderson, with Chick Webb, you know, in these famous battles of the band. Later, you know, in 1903, Louis Russell, you know, the, this, uh, I would say the first pioneer of jazz, well known, very well known in, in jazz in the United States and, and Panama. He um, was another person who was born in, in Bocas del Toro and who... Uh, was Panamanian and played music. He was the son of a famous music teacher. So by, you know, when he was young, he started his professional career and he moved to New Orleans, again, in another banana boat at the beginning of the 20th century and became one of the most important figures in jazz. He was, for example, uh, recording in the 19, late 1920s, some of the first recordings in jazz history. And then in, in less than 10 years, he became one of the most important uh, band leaders uh, in New Orleans, becoming, you know, becoming so important at the end of the, you know, 30s that he became the musical director of Louis Armstrong. As a matter of fact, Louis Armstrong's uh, band uh, was called before the Louis Russell's band. So they, they changed the name to help you know, the career of Louis Armstrong, uh, which is, of course, the father, considered the father of jazz. But we don't, you know, talk about Louis Russell, who was the musical director of Louis Armstrong, who lived in New Orleans and, and met Louis Armstrong. And actually, Louis Armstrong was um, his friend for all his life. And, and because he lived most of his life also in the United States, we forget and we don't want to talk about his Panamanian heritage when it, it really, you know, it was a very important, he was there where, where he became a musician. You know, I can go on forever because there's so many musicians, but I want to I wanna mention one more, Nicolas Goodwin Rodriguez, who moved to New York in 1928 and became a very important performer in New York. He was educated in, in the Juilliard School of Music, and he performed, of course, with Louis Russell, with Bessie Smith, with Re Jelly Roll Morton, and he was an accomplished musician uh, when he uh, came to New York. And he became well known for paying his Juilliard tuition in cash with the money that he earned from his numerous gigs in New York City. So again, we're not just talking about a musician who goes there and struggles and nobody knows him. These are musicians that are very important in the history of New York City, in the history of jazz in New Orleans, um, and they're musical directors for important people um, in the history of jazz. And then I can I can go on uh, 
For example, uh, Sonny White, who was born in 1917 in Panama and moved to the United States in the 1930s. He began performing with Sidney Bechet, whose band included D.C. Gillespie. He played with Artie Shaw, Benny Carter, Lena Horne, Dexter Gordon. I mean, again, with the most important musicians of his time. And he uh, was a very important person in the history of jazz because he was the only one who wanted to record it, the song Strange Fruit with Billie Holiday in the 1930s. Remember, nobody wanted, remember this song was about the lynching of African-Americans in the South. Nobody wanted to record this song. Nobody wanted to hear this song in the first place, especially here in America. And a Panamanian was the one who supported Billie Holiday and they actually uh, fell in love and everything there was a relationship happening, but it was he was from Panama. And uh, a lot of people believe that uh, Strange Fruit is a very significant song, song of the civil rights movements and in jazz and the first direct musical assault upon racial lynches, lynchings in the South. So again, this not like, um, this is a very important um, person that perhaps without him, Billy Holiday, uh, I don't know. We don't know if he could have done it, if she could have uh, recorded the strange fruit because again, at the, at, the, at the time, nobody wanted to record that song. It was a big um, issue. Uh, yeah. yeah, and then I can go on forever. Randy West on... Uh, Frank Anders. So there's so many people that are very important in the history of jazz that uh, that were of Panamanian origin. Okay, and now as we are uh, rapidly approaching the end, maybe 10 or 15 minutes left for us, let's now switch gears and talk about the kinds of jazz that um, emerged out of the counter-imaginary. Uh, most notably, uh, Somo jazz and global jazz. Uh, let's talk about the first and then we'll end with the second. So let's begin um, by discussing kinds of jazz. So um, a couple of the things that the different types of jazz that I talk in the book, one of them is this counter imaginary or these uh, jazz that was created in Panama that is called tambo jazz. Um, yes, and, and this tambo jazz is a mix of the Panamanian the the term, um, the Panamanian tambor, which is the folkloric instrument of Panama, and mm. the mix with jazz and tamborera rhythm, which are folkloric rhythms from Panama, and the mix of that with Cuban danzón, Panamanian music, and jazz. So I I call it you know ta well it is called tambo jazz, but I I um, say in my book that tambo jazz is like the jazz with a Panamanian tinge, and this Panama very specific Panamanian tinge has uh, not only the uh, jazz tradition directly coming from the United States and that that tradition of jazz that I'm talking about that is. Um, I would say folkloric to Panama as well as folkloric to the United States, but also has this other uh, musical tradition is influenced by Calypso, by Panamanian folkloric rhythms and cumbia and also Cuban rhythms, Afro-Cuban jazz and, and Cuban rhythms. So this is this is a, a very important uh, style of music that devel develops a style, but also a culture, the culture of Panamanians who uh, want to stay in Panama and want to mix jazz with these other uh, rhythms and styles. And uh, we have many different, I go through the different um, definitions of tambo jazz because of course there is, uh, several definitions of tambo jazz. Some of them um, are related to the music. Some of them are related to the culture uh, and some of them are related to the people. So uh, that's one of the important um, kind of jazz stories that I talk about. And I talk about another jazz story called global jazz, 
which is the culmination of the book and the last, let's say the the, the last movement is called global jazz. And, and this movement uh, is, you know, represents and kind of explains a whole new era of jazz. Uh, this is contemporary, you know, it's, it's pretty much the, the history of jazz that is happening right now. And uh, we make a difference, I make a difference between global jazz, the globalization of jazz that happened in the 19th, 20th century, which, you know, one type of globalization, and this new era of globalization, which started happening in the 1990s. So pretty much the 21st century. I find that there is a, a new, uh, it's a new world. Um, and we have to change the paradigm of jazz, the paradigm of uh, jazz education. And global jazz, I, you know, pretty much goes to, uh, I go through the, the formation of uh, the concept of global jazz and also the department called Global Jazz Institute at Berkeley College of Music, because this also came uh, from Panama. Mm -hmm. And the the department and the institute was actually opened after the president and vice president went to Panama to see uh, the work of the Panama Jazz Festival, the work of the Danilo Press Foundation, and realized we want to do this. We want to have it. Can you um, teach it to the students from all over the world at Berkeley? And um, this was founded 15 years ago, actually, we're turning 15 years old by Danilo Perez, uh, who is a Panamanian uh, jazz pianist. And uh, we have pretty much created with this institute um, a new paradigm in jazz education that uh, recognizes the pan Afro American experience of jazz. Of course, Latin America is very present in this idea of global jazz. And we also, uh, let's say that we expand this concept of the Latin tinge to new frontiers. Um, we bring, of course, uh, jazz uh, and we mix it with the many different musics of the world, but we also, you know, concentrate in new methodologies, new paradigms and new epistemologies, what I call the Wayne Shorter Quartet epistemologies, because we try to, uh, you know, bring about new knowledge. Uh, to change the the paradigm of jazz education and to change also the imaginaries, especially now that jazz has such a, um, I would say, it, uh, a limited view of its history. Because remember, uh, today we can go through different uh, jazz programs and never have, you know, a woman teaching or never ha even have black students as students in many of the jazz programs, um, you know, again, it's so expensive that only very few people have access to this great jazz program. And this is one of the things that we want to, um, that we want to concentrate at the Global Jazz Institute, not only uh, being able to teach, you know, the music and and the, the scales, but also how can we change the scales to, to serve uh, the students of the new millennium, who have, you know, a, a pretty much a different world than the one we had to deal with. Now, the issues of the new millennium millenniums are um, big issues that have to do with survive the survival of our species. So we have to change the curriculum. We're not in the same world as, you know, 100 years ago. Okay. And now I have um, a few uh, one more central question and then um, something that uh, I would like to ask you about. Uh, it is remarkable um, uh, that your neighbor, the extraordinary Terry Carrington, uh, who is doing phenomenal work um, to create the contributions of gender studies, is working with you. You are neighbors, you are at the same institute. So I imagine your future book um, might probably be entering the zone of gender within Panama and outside of Panama, the Latin world. 
and then expose the subterranean contributions of women in, in particular, in the silent or what you call invisible spaces, uh, whose works have yet to be exposed. I can see a future collaboration between you, uh, Terry Carrington, and of course, um, uh, Danilo himself, and um, giving us a new project. Uh, which I could even imagine entitled, uh, entitling it uh, The Invisible uh, Jazz Woman Artist or something to that effect, something much more um, nuanced than that. That is a future, I think, that uh, I expect uh, you to work on. I'm sure you're already thinking about that because you have your neighbor, uh, Terry Carrington, and also your own revolutionary imagination to embark on this exciting project, I think, that Berkeley could gain from, which is going to be tied publicly for me to ask you to send me a list of some promising students who are working directly under you, um, Danilo and Terry Carrington, um, to excellence, so that I can interview them. Yes, absolutely. Well, the issue of gender is, I think, all over the book, starting with the, um, you know, the imaginary of the Panamanian woman, mm. imaginary of the Panamanian Afro, Panamanian woman, who is very uh, different from the image of the white woman, mm. who is, as I mentioned before, as close to Europe and to Spain as possible, because... Uh, we remember we are uh, in the context of, of white supremacy and racism, and we have to uh, and and you know obsess with Europe. So we had to, uh, you know, I, I show how the Panamanian imaginary woman is depicted in in pre jazz. Now in jazz, I also show a couple of women. Jazz is also a system that has been embedded with patriarchy. So it's very difficult actually to get, um, you know, the, the women in yeah. jazz from Panama, but, yeah. but it's a different process. And I can tell you because I did go through that process a little bit. Um, and the process is about, it has to do with males uh, acknowledging Mm -hmm. the women in their lives that made a big impact in their musical um, development. And it happened that a lot of the great musicians, great jazz musicians from Panama, including Danilo Pere, Perez, had great female teachers. Mm -hmm. So uh, this happened throughout my research that a lot of amazing female teachers that are in obscure places that nobody can see and nobody mentions, uh, they're there. It's just that they're always in the background and they're not mentioned because we're also obsessed with men being the stars of the show. Uh, so the men are all over the place and the women, you have to really go deep into uh, into researching the history of men and men are the ones that eventually are gonna get to those women. And of course, there are also other women, but there are few, the ones that I found. Now, I have a, a good friend who is a jazz singer in Panama. It's called Idania, she's called Idania Doman. She's one of the famous singers in Panama nowadays. And we are actually already starting we started a research and she already did a class at the Panama Jazz Festival with um, concentrating only on the women, um, the women of jazz in Panama. But uh, again, we need a lot more time because it is actually more difficult to unearth the women from the history of jazz because it was already difficult to unearth the the men but the women are even more hidden because they're hidden uh, in the back stories of the men usually as teachers 
or as women who, who were amazing performers and then, you know, got married and couldn't follow their careers or their husbands didn't like them to be, you know, playing in the clubs or women that I also uh, talk in the book, women that are uh, leaders, especially at the beginning of the 20th century, leaders in the business of the clubs, you know, in the nightclub business. Uh, remember that at the time, you know, it that wasn't seen, even, even today, I think that is not seen as a, you know, honorable or, you know, something that a woman should be doing. We're still in very patriarchal times. So again, it's not, it's not easy. You have to go deep into history, but also deep into the history of the men and the the amazing, brilliant women, many, many multi-instrumentalists, many almost genius uh, of music that had, you know, immense talent, perfect pitch, multi-instrumentalists that are completely erased, you know, by by the status quo narratives. One, uh, I foresee the possibility um, of um, excellence one day to be invited to the Panama Jazz Festival to do an interview on the Absolutely. floor of the Absolutely. Panama, something that the foundation might want to look at. Absolutely, Professor. You're already invited. Well, thank you so much. This has been your host, uh, Teodoros Kiros uh, for Excellence, with the great uh, professor and the great jazz artist herself, as humble as she is, who is really the voice of the la Latina world, uh, Latin world, uh, from Berkeley College of Music. Uh, African um, ex uh, excellence, rather, is uh, honored and uh, privileged to have had you for one full hour, which is only uh, the beginning of a lifetime collaboration. Thanks for joining us.